thank you very much for that. And uh, it is great to be back here at Southern. Um, when I was a seminary student down in central Kentucky, I would slip up here now and then and use the enviable library, which had greater resources, especially in some of the patristics work I was doing during my MDiv. Um, well, it's great to be with you, and I want to just jump straight into this set of lectures on union with Christ, systematically considered. Um, here's a quick overview of the series. Nobody can do full justice to the doctrine of union with Christ, but the most insightful treatments of the theme throughout Christian history have in common a certain centripetal energy, a center-seeking tendency that strives to recognize the doctrine as soteriologically fundamental. So my goal in these lectures is to join that movement by examining how the truth of union with Christ shapes not only the doctrine of salvation in the narrower sense, including the order of salvation, the ordo salutis, but also the overall Christian creed and even the basic forms of scripture itself. Though necessarily I can only accomplish an initial approach to these things, these lectures are an effort to place the doctrine of union with Christ at the controlling center of soteriology. So I do have a book uh, under contract on this subject, and so this is kind of my first uh, you know, public airing of, of some of the uh, approach I'll be taking in that book later on with um, Baker Academic. So lecture one, a creedal and credible account of union with Christ. While it makes sense to speak about the Christian doctrine of God or the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, it seems somehow less believable in the contemporary world to assert that there is such a thing as one single Christian doctrine of salvation. I mean, whatever convergence and agreement there may be in the great central teachings about God and Christ, common truths recognized and enshrined in the earliest Christian creeds and liturgies and commentaries, surely when it comes to the matter of soteriology, there must be more divergence and disagreement. I mean, don't the various branches of Christendom often do their branching out precisely here over questions of salvation? Conventional wisdom holds that the many complex questions that arise here in soteriology are the very questions over which we divide into diverse traditions, say Roman Catholic and Protestant, distinct denominations, say Lutheran and Reformed, and even antagonistic families or tribes, say Calvinist and Arminian, Pedobaptist and Credo-Baptist, and so on. So where we would never in good taste let ourselves speak of a peculiarly Baptist doctrine of the Trinity, can you imagine, or an exclusively Presbyterian doctrine of the Incarnation, horrors, we do sometimes feel that it makes sense to speak of a range or variety of soteriologies in the plural, and so we sometimes speak that way. But in this lecture, I want to argue that this uh, speaking this way can signal an underlying error in our understanding of the faith. To think of Christian traditions as being parceled out and divided up among competing soteriologies is just too obscure to do justice to the actual lay of the land. The soteriological lay of the land, I want to press, is the domain of the doctrine of union with Christ. There are differences among Christians and churches, of course. Some differences run very deep, and in hard cases, they even leave different groups questioning each other's status as Christians. In extreme cases, not even questioning someone's status, but denying it. See Machen's critique of systematized theological liberalism as, quote, another religion. We should clearly acknowledge these theological differences. We should be analytically clear and intellectually honest about them and learn the procedural rules for how to fight fair, how to argue well, um, so that our territorial disputes over matters of the gospel are both vigorous and virtuous. Good fences make good neighbors. Unclear boundaries invite border skirmishes. Sound theology tends to draw distinctions, not dissolve them. But to stick to the land metaphor for a minute, where most differences in soteriology are within the province of real estate, union with Christ is geography, the vast and fundamental ground itself. Both require surveying, but the surveys are on radically different scales. And one of them rests on the other for its solidity its orientation, and its possibilities of cultivation. So I want to argue that there is, in fact, such a thing as a common Christian account of what salvation is, and that a great deal actually depends on us learning to see it for what it is, and to behave as believers who make our approach to that single soteriology in all the details and complications of our differences, warranted as those differences may be.
The one single Christian doctrine of salvation concerns union with Christ. It is characterized by a recognizably Christian way of approaching Christ, unitively, paying a particular kind of attention to Jesus Christ himself, seeing him for who he truly is, coming to him in need and obedience, and uniting to him. This approach to salvation in Christ is so deeply embedded in the Christian faith that it is the spiritual reality which generated the ancient creeds, guided the ecumenical councils, and continuously underwrites doctrinal contemplation of salvation across a vast array of classic theological sources. Most of this first lecture will consist of discerning the form of union with Christ in those creeds, councils, and contemplations. But first, a word on why this account of union with Christ is simultaneously creedal and credible. I did the alliteration on the titles to kind of enculturate my message for a Baptist context. <laughs> uh, but, but I've got something in mind with creedal and credible. It has to do not only with what we believe, creedal, but also with whether we are believable, credible. On the face of it, the contemporary culture is more inclined to give Christian truth claims a hearing if the truth claims are plausibly presented as representing what Christians believe, rather than just what one subsection of the Christians believe. Christian claims tend to be more persuasive when more unified. At least the inquiring secular mind can proceed more directly to entertaining the truth claims of Christian theology if it can skip over the appearance of plurality, disagreement, and difference. The message of salvation as it comes to people in the world today would be more persuasive if all who claimed the name of Christ were agreed on and eloquent about the same doctrine of salvation. To that extent, our credibility depends a great deal on the effectiveness of our common creedality. We will be more believable if the we and we believe includes a vast global ancient congregating of the faithful. There's at least a strategic advantage to being able to invite people to consider a Christian faith that presents a definite profile recognizable from a distance. Now, if you're anything like me, your preferred way for all of us to reach doctrinal agreement is for everybody to stop disagreeing with you and start agreeing with you. Problem solved. But in the meantime, we do well not to exaggerate our differences. The power of unified testimony is part of what Jesus meant when he prayed in John 17, 21, not just for his first disciples, but for those who would believe in him through their testimony, that they may all be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, in, qu in quoting Jesus' high priestly prayer just now, I jumped straight from his desire that they may all be one to the outcome that the world may believe. What my quotation skipped over was the most important part. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. But that is precisely what I want to devote our time together to surveying. Against the eternal, all-sufficient background of the unity of the Trinity, the Father and the Son, and the Son and the Father, Jesus sets forth this reality, that they may be in us. So let's discern our union with Christ. I want to start by examining the two classic early Christian creeds, that is, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Now, in, in examining them for their soteriology of union with Christ, we're resisting the fairly widespread conventional wisdom that says the early centuries of the church didn't have a carefully elaborated view of salvation. In its weakest manifestations, uh, this objection is an ill-informed and lazy wave of the hand at pervasive pluralism, a vague sense that the ecumenical councils were about Trinity and Christology, not soteriology, leaving us in doubt about what salvation even means or meant according to the early church. But in its strongest form, the observation has some merit. The claim is that the early church did not produce unified soteriological theory at the doctrinal or theological level because soteriology simply wasn't one of the contested issues that the early church elevated to the level of having councils about. No less an authority than J.N.D. Kelly put it this way, the student who seeks to understand the soteriology of the fourth and early fifth centuries will be sharply disappointed if he expects to find anything corresponding to the elaborately worked out syntheses which the theology of the Trinity and the Incarnation present. In both these latter departments, controversy forced fairly exact definition on the church, whereas the redemption did not become a battleground for rival schools until the 12th century when Anselm's Curdeus Homo focused attention on it. Instead, the student must be prepared to pick his way through a variety of theories to all appearance unrelated 
and even mutually incompatible, existing side by side and sometimes sponsored by the same theologian. So far, Kelly. Uh, the statement about Anselm at a battleground for rival schools is telling, but we'll return to that in the third lecture. Our immediate task is to respond by taking up and reading the central text of the early church's response to scripture. We begin with the Apostles' Creed and then take up the contemplation of, oh, and then turn to the Nicene. After that, we'll look briefly at the thrust of the ecumenical councils and then take up the contemplation of union with Christ in one selected classic text. A hint, it's Calvin. Okay, so the Apostles' Creed, articulated for union with Christ. The Apostles' Creed has three articles, each, one for each person of the Trinity. The first article, on God the Father Almighty, is very short. He created heaven and earth. Much more could be said about God the Father, but it is not said here in the Apostles' Creed. The doctrine of the first person of the Trinity, or paterology, uh, that's, that's a word that's out there, but... I, you know, I don't recommend using it or anything. You, you, you need a word for this doctrine, though. It is not elaborated with a series of clauses. We don't get much by way of recital of attributes or actions. In fact, what the creed confesses, um, when the creed confesses faith in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, it provides exactly one attribute, omnipotence or almightiness, and one action, creation. But neither of these is unique to the Father in the sense of excluding the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is, the Son is also almighty and is also agent of creation. Likewise, coming third in order of mention, the almighty creator spirit is not excluded. So what is the Apostles' Creed doing by ascribing this attribute and this action to the Father? It's applying these things by way of appropriation. Appropriation means uh, names a theological move in which a common attribute or action belonging equally to the three persons of the Trinity is predicated to one person because although it belongs to Godhead as such, it bears an instructive likeness to the personal distinction of that person, allowing us to discern that person's character within the eternal Trinity's relations. In this case, the Father is the person of the Trinity who is the principle of the Son and Spirit. According to the doctrines of eternal generation and spiration, from all eternity, the Son and Spirit subsist as being from the Father. They come from him. And this inner Trinitarian consubstantial coming from, while it is certainly not the same thing as the world coming from the triune God, is nevertheless instructively like the world coming from the triune God. God's creation, even though it is ex nihilo, from nothing, and it enters into temporality, is a kind of gigantic resemblance to the Father's distinct hypostatic character as principle of the Son. The Apostles' Creed thus quietly commandeers the language of the invisible, indivisible outer work of the Almighty Trinity in order to give us the opportunity to discern the inner reality of the Father. But it happens in the flash of just a few words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The Apostles' Creed is in a hurry to get to something else. That something else is the second article on the Son. The Creed's rush to Christology is instructive. Nobody knows the Father except the Son. And even though the creed intentionally unspools in serial order, its decision to start with the Father must rapidly give way to the revelation of the Son. The second article is the longest article in the creed, largely because it retells the story of Jesus. He was conceived by the Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, buried, descended into hell, rose again and ascended into heaven, sits at the Father's right hand and will return to judge the living and the dead. This abbreviated story of the life of Jesus is the center of the creed, a tiny recapitulation of the main points of his life, tracking closely with the outline of the Gospels, or even more closely with the brief summaries of the life of Jesus featured in early Christian preaching, such as Peter's sermon in the house of Cornelius in Acts 10. Now, the second article is not all story. It begins with the cluster of five names and titles, Jesus, Christ, Only Begotten, Son, and Lord. This Christological recital of titles uh, concentrates a great deal of bibl biblical vocabulary in a short span, easy to memorize. In fact, the Apostles' Creed may have expanded outward from the original simple confession, Jesus is Lord, according to some theories of historic credogenesis. I just made up that word, but it's a, it's a pretty good word, credogenesis. Genesis. 
We can imagine opening up that primal confession and inserting between Jesus and Lord the titles Christ, Only Begotten, and Son. Only Begotten Son, of course, is the Trinitarian anchor that holds the second article to the first. In retrospect, we see that the deepest meaning of Father in the first article was always Father of the Son. And now we come to know him in knowing the Son of the Father. So there's a solid foundation in the names and titles, but what is built on them is the gospel story. That decision to recite the story of Jesus is structurally central to the Apostles' Creed. Even in the brief formula specifying the content of Christian faith and the identity of the Christian God, the Creed, the formulas function to enshrine the irreducible and irreplaceable story in which the identity of the incarnate Son is rendered for us. So the second article is also the most tightly coherent of the three, precisely because it follows a narrative logic. He was conceived, born, suffered, died, rose. Obviously, much is omitted from the recital. There is nothing between the birth of Jesus and his suffering under Pontius Pilate. The creed skips the 30-something years of the life of Jesus, skips his entire ministry and teaching, and instead makes a direct line for the cross. The creed goes from Christmas to Easter in a single bound. And lest we say this decision was based on the sheer need to be brief, the creed then devotes several clauses to the final week. Suffered, crucified, dead, buried, descended, rose again. Why only these? Why all of these? Viewed merely as a summary, the decisions embedded into the creed's selections are peculiar enough to pose the question of what principles drove the selectivity. In terms of selectivity, though, it is the third article of the creed which is the oddest assortment of the three. It curtly says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and then continues with something like a list of various other things we believe. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. While each of these merits close attention and theological elaboration, they seem to lack the kind of inevitability that would make them obvious as a cluster. And they're not held together by the narrative logic that guided the second article. But here, in the gap between the second and third articles, is where the formative power of the doctrine of union with Christ truly exerts itself. Skipping over for a moment the phrases about the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, notice the closing triad, forgiveness, resurrection, and everlasting life. Some Reformation commentators on the creed have noted that these three things are benefits of union with Christ. Because we are in Christ, we have forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So in that sense, the creed's three articles do the work of articulating, get it, the articles articulate, the doctrine of union with Christ by first telling his story and then naming the blessings that flow from it for those who are in Christ. The status of being in Christ is introduced under the governing head of believing in the Holy Spirit. In other words, the second article states in Christological terms the accomplishment of redemption. And the third article states in pneumatological terms the application of redemption. That's the main point, but the creed's articulation of union with Christ by the work of the Spirit seems to be even closer than that. There's an observable correspondence between three sequential events of the second article and the three benefits of the third article. Here they are. Corresponding to the second article's, I believe that Jesus was crucified, is the third article's, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Stated backwards, why do I believe in the forgiveness of sins? Because I believe that Jesus was crucified. Corresponding to the, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, is, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And corresponding to, I believe that he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, is, I believe in life everlasting. You can write this out in columns for yourself and draw the lines between the articles. It's a compelling alignment between the accomplishing of salvation in Christ and the application of its benefits to believers in the Spirit. The second article is the story of how this redemption is worked out in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ himself. The third article tells how it is worked in by the Holy Spirit in the church for us. Now, it's easy to think of union with Christ as one of the things we believe as Christians, and there's a sense in which that's true. A responsible list of doctrines will include many distinct theological topics, and union with Christ will be one among the many. But taking union with Christ in its broader sense, it is an exceedingly broad doctrine with a strategic role to play in determining the form and content of Christian faith. 
we might think of it this way. We come to the ancient witness to inquire whether union with Christ is in the creed, and we discover that the creed is actually inside of union with Christ, in the sense that the creed is what it is because it arises to articulate redemption accomplished and applied. Now, much of what we've just seen in the Apostles' Creed applies also to the Nicene Creed. That is, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed of 381, but I'm not going to say that again. In particular, we find in the Nicene Creed a three-article statement of faith in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in which the first and third articles are carefully gathered around a second article, in which at the heart of the heart of the faith is a miniature gospel story. In seven or eight points, the story of Jesus is retold, and while there are fascinating variations of selection and phrasing uh, between the two creeds, the plot outline is quite similar. Conception by the Spirit and birth from Mary, crucifixion, death, and burial, resurrection, ascent, and session. What distinguishes the Nicene Creed, though, is how this narrative Christological core is introduced. Instead of being satisfied to introduce uh, him with a rapid series of key biblical names and titles, the Nicene Creed goes on to say of the only begotten Son, rather elaborately, that he is begotten of the Father before all ages, and that he is begotten, not made. We can think of these two phrases as expanding on what, this, what his monogenes sonship means in the Creed. Positively, it's an eternal begetting rather than one bounded by time, having a beginning or end. That is the sense of begotten of the Father before all ages. Negatively, it's explicitly not creation, Though the Son and the world are both from the Father, the unique fromness that the Son has is absolutely distinct from the kind of fromness uh, that the world has. That is the meaning of begotten, not made. Between these positive and negative specifications of the Son's generation is a kind of poetic triad that rings the changes on the concept of fromness. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. These build cumulatively on each other, but what each of them accomplishes is to take a word or symbol for deity and repeat it, placing in the midst of the repetition this notion of fromness. So the one God is named twice by the same noun, held apart by nothing but the preposition from. We hear of light and then again of the same light, for God is light, 1 John 1, 5. But the light has within itself a relation of fromness. There is relationship within the light that is God. The Son is true God, but in the Nicene way of confessing it, he is true God standing in the relation of being from true God. Finally, the precision of all this is strategically secured by calling him homoousios, that is, of the identical nature, consubstantial with the Father. Now, because of the famous controversies of the fourth century, the Nicene Creed goes to great lengths to specify the identity of the Son before it begins to deploy the Gospel summary. We might say it displays the same precious Christological jewel as the Apostles' Creed, but invests much more heavily in securing its setting. And the Nicene Creed has one more addition to make before plunging into the Jesus story. Between the eternal identity of the only begotten Son in the consubstantial Trinity and his incarnation for us and our salvation, the Nicene Creed inserts the phrase, through him all things were made. The line is of course taken from the prologue of John's Gospel. But by deploying it precisely here, the Nicene Creed makes extra certain to place the Son on the Creator side of the Creator-Creature distinction. A poor reading of the Apostles' Creed might just have been able to take the words in sequence and put the Son on the Creature side. After all, in the Apostles' Creed, wasn't God the Father named first as Almighty Maker of heaven and earth before the Son was introduced? Creation seems to intrude between Father and Son if you take a, a bad Here's how the word goes reading of the Apostles' Creed. Um, it would be desperate misinterpretation of the Apostles' Creed, but one not explicitly excluded by the actual text in so many words. Not so for the Nicene Creed. All things were made through this Son. And only when that has been reaffirmed does the Nicene Creed go on to give us the story of his incarnate work. Imagine if the line about creation were not included. In its absence, the Nicene Creed would move directly from begotten of the Father before all ages, consubstantial with the Father, to for us and our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man. We could still see the great distinction between who God the Son eternally is by nature and what God the Son freely undertakes to do by grace. 
Eternally by nature, he is the divine son. Freely by grace, he assumes human nature to save it. The line distinguishing one from the other is here, running right through the center of the second article of the Nicene Creed. It's a clear, bright line between what the church fathers called theologia and oikonomia, between God's eternal nature and God's work of salvation. It is the most important line dividing the field of Christian theology. It recognizes the deep aseity and absolute self-sufficiency of God while keeping grace truly gracious. The eternal son would have been fully himself in the unity of father, son, and spirit above that line, even if counterfactually he had not freely come down and been incarnate and become human. In fact, the eternal son would have been fully himself in the Trinity, even if counterfactually the world itself had not been created. And that is why the Nicene Creed introduces this statement about creation at precisely this point in the Creed. Before entering into the gospel story, all things were made through him and he came down. Placing the reference to creation at this point means double underlining the fact that in taking on human nature, the son was crossing over the line between creator and creature without blurring or dissolving it. In terms of the development of Christian thought, the church did not so much enter the fourth century with a clearly expressed doctrine of what creation was and then subsequently ask which side of that line the son was on. It was actually, historically speaking, confessing the son's identity that led Christian theology to become urgently, increasingly clear about the status of creation from nothing to help shore up this Christological distinction. A major function of the explicit Christian confession of creation is to clarify the articulation of the son's identity. Now, as for union with Christ, this Nicene perspective on the gospel story makes two very important contributions to the doctrine of union with Christ. First, as we've seen, it deepens the personal identity of the Son. He, who is who he, he is who he is because of how he is related to the Father. And that means that his identity is infinitely, omnipotently, eternally itself. Far from being contingent on the outcome of any history, the identity of the Son is as necessary as the reality of God. He truly comes among us and is present from the infinite depths of absolute perfection and fullness. And that's a lot. But the second contribution made by the Nicene perspective on the gospel story is encapsulated in the formula for us and for our salvation. It draws out the fact that everything that takes place below the Nicene line that runs between theologia and oikonomia is always already designed by God to be applied to us. That is, we go into the gospel story having been given reassurance in advance from the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of creation that what the Son does in the incarnation, he does not for himself but for us. We do not hear the story and then wait wondering about its application. That gap or interval between the work of Christ for us and the work of the Spirit applying it to us is not a gap of suspense. It's certainly not the case that in the Jesus story, something happens that is irrelevant to us and that it is then subsequently made relevant by the work of the Spirit applying it to us. That's not how application works. What the Nicene approach sheds light on is the fact that union with Christ in its broadest sense is functioning normatively both in the accomplishment of redemption and in the application of redemption. Later on, we'll see the reasons why it's also valuable to talk about union with Christ in a more restricted sense and to say why it especially belongs to the application side of the ledger under the heading of the work of the Spirit. But especially doesn't mean exclusively. The incarnation is also already in itself for us and our salvation. Union with Christ is too expansive, or in the words of John Murray, too broad and embracive to be contained under the heading of application. So much for the creedal character of union with Christ. Now, though I've left a space for it in my outline, we don't have time to trace the conciliar character of union with Christ. The challenge mentioned by J.N.D. Kelly that the early church had councils on Trinity and Christology, but not on redemption and soteriology, deserves to be addressed directly. While acknowledging the element of truth in this historical observation, I believe it fails to reckon with how the logic of union with Christ was a driving force behind most of the councils. A good argument can be made that, while well, I'm saying a good argument can, make, can be made because I'm not making it here, I'm telling you this is where it goes. Right? A good argument can be made um, that the, while the topic of the councils was the nature of Christ, 
Nevertheless, the decisions were always animated by a soteriological concern, and not just implicitly or anonymously. In fact, the ecumenical councils stated more or less explicitly a number of principles that can be called soteriological axioms. Only God can save us, soteriology, so the Savior must be God, Christology. What is not assumed is not healed, soteriology, so the Savior must be fully human, Christology. These principles taken together ought to be read as an expression of the theology of union with Christ being elaborated in terms of its objective basis as Christ's union with us that takes, us, takes up into itself our union with Christ. For fans of conciliar Christology, uh, let me just say that uh, this objective basis of union with Christ is both carefully Chalcedonian and also unitively Cyrilline. So there's some ferment going on right now in the interpretation of early Christology, and uh, uh, this, this can align with uh, the, the newer school of this Cyrilline reading of, of Neo-Chalcedonianism. Okay, let's bracket that for now, and for thematic reasons, leap all the way forward to John Calvin. We turn to Calvin because the creedal setting of union with Christ has rarely been brought out as well as it was by John Calvin. The classic location is Institutes, Book 2, Chapter 16. In Book 2, Calvin has worked through the life of Christ, following roughly the order of the Apostles' Creed, which he says he followed, quote, because it states the leading articles of redemption in a few words, and may thus serve as a tablet in which the points of Christian doctrine most deserving of attention are brought separately and distinctly before us. Then, after having analyzed how each aspect of Christ's work is effective for us and our salvation, Calvin delivers this comprehensive summary. Uh, this is actually one long periodic sentence in Latin with a, it's a series of ifs. So get your uh, Renaissance humanism listening ears on, and here's Calvin. We see that our whole salvation and all its parts are comprehended in Christ. We should therefore take care not to derive the least portion of it from anywhere else. Here's the long part. If we seek salvation, we are taught by the very name of Jesus that it is of him. If we seek any other gifts of the Spirit, they will be found in his anointing. If we seek strength, it lies in his dominion. If purity, in his conception. If gentleness, it appears in his birth. For by his birth, he was made like us in all respects that he might learn to feel our pain. If we seek redemption, it lies in his passion. If acquittal, in his condemnation. If remission of the curse, in his cross. If satisfaction, in his sacrifice. If purification, in his blood. If reconciliation, in his descent into hell. If mortification of the flesh, in his tomb. If newness of life, in his resurrection. If immortality, in the same. If inheritance of all blessings, in his kingdom. If untroubled expectation of judgment, in the power given to him to judge. In short, since rich store of every kind of good abounds in him, let us drink our fill from this fountain and from no other. Now, alert listeners will have already noticed that Calvin is rehearsing the gospel story of Jesus, but specifically in the terms given by the Apostles' Creed, uh, cross, descent into hell, resurrection. While Calvin's, what Calvin's doing in this elaborate sentence is taking the points of the creed and drawing out their soteriological implications. Each of these actions of Christ has saving power, and Calvin names each of them in turn with his if-then structure, if redemption, then the passion, if eternal life, then his resurrection, and so on. This long structure of many ifs is sandwiched between two shorter sentences that both make two related points about the comprehensive and exclusivity of this salvation that is found in Christ. It's not just some of our salvation or some parts of it, but our whole salvation and all its parts that are there in Christ as a rich store of every kind of good. Therefore, we must take care not to derive the least portion of it from anywhere else, but to drink our fill from this fountain and no other. It's all in Christ, and you should seek no other, Calvin insisted. He was reforming. He was preaching into a church culture that was trying to unlearn its bad habits of supplementing salvation with a little of this over here and a little of that and a little of the other thing. Salvation in Christ is comprehensive and complete, shutting out other saviors. But those conclusions depend on Calvin making his case in the central sentence, the one that draws water joyfully from the well of salvation by returning over and over, if after if, to the things confessed in the middle of the Apostles' Creed. Calvin's close following of the Apostles' Creed is even more evident 
if you compare the creed in Latin to what Calvin originally wrote in his Latin Institutes. You can notice, for example, that the line, if we seek, if we seek strength, it is in his dominion, um, is echoing the word Lord. The reason Calvin talks about dominion here is that it is answering to the creed's confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is, in Latin, dominus. We have strength from him being dominus, having dominion. So the creed's string of Christological titles, Jesus Christ our Lord, shows up here as Jesus, that is, Yahweh is salvation. If we seek salvation, we are taught by the very name of Jesus, that it's in him. Lord, that is Dominus, if we seek strength, it's in his dominion. And then um, Christ, that is the anointed one. If we seek any other gifts of the spirit, it's in his anointing. It's kind of subtle the first couple times you go through this section of Calvin until you realize like, oh, that was, that was Jesus Christ Lord that he was doing there. He's, he's investing thought in each word of the creed. After Lord Jesus Christ, you can start to see it's all right there. Conception, birth, passion, condemnation, etc. Even untroubled expectation of judgment based on Christ coming to judge the living and the dead. It's a masterful and delightful interaction with the creed's union soteriology. Since I've drawn attention to some of its beauties that are in danger of being lost in translation from Latin, let me further point out that Calvin's Reformation polemic against Roman Catholic errors and distortions would also have been more evident to 16th century readers of ecclesiastical Latin. If you look through the benefits of union with Christ that Calvin enumerates, you notice how many of them are key words in the medieval Roman Catholic pastoral care system. We have the words indulgentia, indulgence, absolution, remission, satisfaction, purgation. English translations can't really retain all of what Calvin's accomplishing here in his close reading of the creed on union with Christ. But as he moves through the benefits of union, he uses them to answer the long list of our spiritual needs, all of them. And by doing so, he shows how the sacramental ecclesial mediatorial system of the Roman Catholic Church had been displaced in advance by the all-sufficiency of Christ himself as Savior. If you need indulgences, absolution, remission of sins, satisfaction, purgatory, etc., find them all in Christ. Our whole salvation and all its parts are comprehended there. Michael Horton says that Calvin's real genius, quote, is to be found in his remarkable ability to synthesize the best thought of the whole Christian tradition and sift it with rigorous exegetical skill and evangelical instincts. In this one-sentence survey of union with Christ, we have Calvin's whole strategy of reformation in a microcosm. Leverage the central, most Catholic elements of the church's creedal heritage in order to critique and displace recent deviations. That's the plan. Magnify Christ himself and put his competitors out of business. Find all you need in Christ as the great church has classically confessed him and fix what has gone astray. Now, from this vantage point, the whole field of Christian theological history lies open before us, and I believe we could easily call dozens of witnesses from well-known classic writings and confessions in support of the claim that there's such a thing as the one Christian doctrine of salvation. It is the powerful scriptural, spiritual drive toward union with Christ that gave rise to the creeds themselves and flows out into the faithful expositors of that creedal and credible mere Christian account of salvation. Of course, there are differences and disagreements between various Christian traditions about very important details within that soteriology. But um, I take myself to be arguing within a 21st century context where Christian disunity is often strategically exaggerated in a way that undercuts the clarity of Christian witness. We don't need to speculate about who benefits most immediately from Christian disunity, but we do need to strive to discern wherever possible the real unity we do have. I hope that selecting Calvin as a key witness has helped suggest some of the balanced judgment necessary in handling the Christian doctrine of union with Christ. Calvin was famously and conspicuously opposed to Roman Catholic errors, but we've seen him draw the main force of reformation from one clear source, the great shared Christian soteriology of union with Christ. We should do likewise and not be tricked by the spirit of our decadent age into exaggerating Christian theological fragmentation. So I want to close with a few suggestions for thinking and speaking rightly about salvation under this great rubric of union with Christ. While we shouldn't place, more va um, place much value in simply policing our language or correcting our habits of speech, we can start there and pursue the intention to follow through with resolve to see more deeply and understand more clearly what our words are helping us look at. First, based on this analysis of the creedal matrix of union with Christ, 
we should remember to speak of the one Christian doctrine of salvation, a single shared soteriology, and avoid pluralizing and, mic and multiplying soteriologies. We shouldn't speak much of atonement theories at all for reasons about which I'll go into detail in the third lecture. When we fight fair about the doctrine of salvation, we should first invoke the overarching commonalities and then descend to the crucial details of a more local specified level. When we do occasionally indulge in large-scale comparative soteriology fights or contrasting views of the atonement, we should take care that we are making wise use of these contrastive strategies and not instead being used by them. Second, once we're alert to the creedal matrix of union with Christ, we should continually touch base with this classic guidance about salvation by union with Christ. There is such a thing as theological progress, and things can get better than they are. But the way forward for us is always going to involve backing up and getting a running start from the deep history of the classic Christian tradition. Third, and relatedly, we should gather all the wisdom we can from the ancient core confession of salvation by union with Christ, looking for ways to retrieve it and bring it forward for contemporary use. Our modern ways of handling soteriology are in many cases badly distorted by the decadent patterns of our theological and institutional cultures. We cannot simply go back to the classical modes, but we can retrieve and employ as much of them as we are able to understand and make use of. Fourth, a suggestion along those lines of one thing to retrieve, a kind of Christ-centeredness that is oddly alien to us. Think about this. The classic creedal patristic articulation of union with Christ was so wrapped up in tracing the identity and work of Christ and narrating it that the conventional wisdom of our age failed to even recognize it as soteriology at all. It was so baked into the creedal matrix that we were in danger of thinking they were not yet talking about union with Christ, but were still just talking about Jesus. There's something here from which we can learn. Stated as a principle, a doctrine of union with Christ should rivet our attention on Jesus Christ. Stated in terms of a research program, how can a doctrine of union with Christ rivet our attention on Jesus Christ? That's my research question. Fifth and finally, a word from the late John Webster about the task of theology. In a 2002 autobiographical essay, Webster looked back on his rather defective training and made this resolution. I resolved to structure the content of my teaching in accordance with the intellectual and spiritual logic of the Christian confession as it finds expression in the classical creeds, to allow that structure to stand and to explicate itself, and not to press the material into some other format. Webster went on to name two tasks that followed from resolving to pursue theology in this manner. One is that of becoming, a, oh, this is Webster's own, own words, quote, one is that of becoming acquainted with the history of Christian theology and coming to understand it as the history of the church, that is, as spiritual history, as a history of attempts to articulate the gospel, and not just as a lumber room full of opinions to be submitted to the critical scrutiny of valuers and then auctioned off or discarded. The other task is that of trying to understand and think through the categories of classical dogmatics in their totality and their interrelations, to acquire a proper grasp of the architecture of dogmatics and to see its shape as the science of the church's confession." Close quote. In the matter of union with Christ, this seems to me to be the way of wisdom, not to press the material into some other mold, but to seek insight into how it explicates itself. Thank you.